I'm here with Lynn Morris, and this is her new book, and it is The Circus, Media, Politics, and Power in the Era of Trump. And uh, I've known Lynn for a long time, so it's uh, good to be able to interview you live. Uh, and her credentials are, she studies the interplay between media, politics, and power in contemporary geopolitical systems. Uh, Lynn holds a master's in communication research from the University of South Carolina, and has also studied at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government and the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Welcome and thank you for this very interesting book that you've written. I uh, read through it this weekend and you hit a bunch of points that on maybe a subconscious level I was aware of, but uh, you put it all in a nice, concise, tight little, um, tight little book. And what made you write this? Well, I was really interested in the public dialogue and what's happening in the public conversation in the United States. And my feeling was that I don't think we really understand the narrative very well. The narrative is so divergent from where we need to be and what social science says about what's happening with regard to our emotional reactions to the media. And so I, I wanted to dig into that a little bit and um, think more about how we can actually get the narrative going in a positive way. Well, do you think we've ever been able to process it or is this just some sort of new dysfunction that we've stumbled into? No, we've, we've always done that. And in, in, uh, in my book, I talk about something called the in-group, out-group phenomenon or what researchers call convex perception which means that, you know, if you look at the world surrounded by symbols, we're all trying to make meaning out of random stuff. Uh, then you have the idea of how do we assemble that meaning for ourselves? And one theory is we want to belong, we want to be in an in-group, and because of that, we tend to categorize the group on the other side. And we derive our own meaning based on that derivation of what we think the other is about. In, in the mid 80s, I got really interested in this because of Reagan and his evil empire comments. And I did one of the first large based um, media studies relating to stereotyping and media reporter preparedness. And I looked at how do we derive our understandings of what does our culture really mean? What do governments really mean to us? And how do we make sense out of that ra those random bits of knowledge? And are we actually dealing with facts or are we dealing with stereotypes? And to, the short answer to your question is that we always deal with stereotypes, but we're unaware of doing that. Yeah, you start off the book on stereotypes and the, the, the phenomenal su success uh, the current president has had in using short epithets to diminish or embellish uh, people that he's for or against at the time, whatever the the problem du jour is, and 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 a lot of those epithets are full of dog whistles for not our better better angels at all. Um, and the, uh, the, 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 my husband talks about this a lot, the tribalism that, that we're all functioning under more or less. Right. So, um, so, uh, on, on the epithets that he uses, you, you, you start off the book talking about that. Um, what is, uh, what, have we had a president that's done that before? I don't think to such a degree. A, no, not publicly. And you know, I think what we what's happening here is a. If you look at epithets as a way of, it's like a shortcut to a. It's, it's sort of the fast track to stereotyping, right? You know, you mm -hmm. have crooked Hillary or 
or Sleepy Joe or whatever. You can name all of them off the top of your head. And what that does is that allows certain people who maybe don't know that much about what's really going on, who are, are looking for someone to identify with. You talked about Dr. Johnson and his interest in tribalism. It's kind of the way that you create a tribe is saying, okay, well, we're, you know, um, the Jets and you can be, you know, the, the other, the other group. Um, and so I think that we've never had a president who's really done that publicly like this. But we've also never had a media environment like this where it meant anything. Nixon did it. Johnson did it. Lots of other presidents did it, but they didn't do it in a way that was so instantaneous. So, um, Prior to our interview here, you you've been working on this um, subject for a long time. Uh, from your perspective, as someone who studies media, who, who's, who's deeply uh, interested in media, what got you started on this, and what do you what do you hope we're going to get out of this? Right. Well, um, in the mid '80s, I was at University of South Carolina, and I had the opportunity to study with two great social scientists, one of whom was named uh, Rick Lowndes Stevens, who he uh, basically did training for media reporters at the Pentagon and for public information officers for the military. And he studied things like the discussion of economics and the news and that sort of thing. Uh, and then my other uh, mentor was a man named Robert Jones, who basically is, was the founder of political polling exit polling for newspapers in the United States. He founded something called the Minnesota Poll, uh, which you know was really the start of the interplay between media and public opinion research in this country. And so I got really interested because in the, in the early 80s, during the height of the sort of glasnost period uh, related to the Soviet Union, uh, there was lots of popular media that stereotype the Russians. There were movies like, you know, Rocky, where um, you know that where they fight in Russia. There was a, a James Bond film that dealt with the Russians, and the Russians were always depicted in a certain way. And it was just at a time where we were just getting the opportunity to actually connect with the Soviets on a personal basis. There was something called the Space Bridge, which um, happened in the mid '80s that I was invited to attend, where they invited um, U.S. journalists to talk face-to-face -face with Russian journalists uh, via satellite. Um, there was a very popular commentator named Vladimir Posner, who uh, was a good friend and uh, colleague of um, uh, Gorbachev at that time. And there was just a lot of interest in the Russians, but also a lot of misinformation. So I got interested uh, in answering the, or looking at the question, I think we never really answer these questions. Um, how do we define what a culture is? And how do we make sense of what we really know about it? And so what I did is I designed four, I called them sectors, uh, culture, history, politics, and geography. And then I went to foreign news editors at uh, places like the New York Times and the Washington Post. And I went to researchers at think tanks like the, the New York, the NYU Center for Law Media, um, War, Peace, and the News Media, and the Carter Center in Emory. And I asked the top researchers there, what do you think is important to know about a culture? And so I whittled all that down and designed a survey that looked at basic cultural knowledge about the Soviet Union in those four areas. And I gave that survey to about 500 in total um, beginning reporters at major news outlets in the United States, because these were people who were covering the Soviet Union. But the basic understanding of their knowledge didn't really line up with um, what a basic understanding for a reporter should be with regard to that um, that country and that political discussion. So my theory was by improving reporter engagement, greater understanding of the issues, but that in turn improves public engagement, the public becomes more informed and they're able to make more 
accurate understandings of what's going on as opposed to just stereotypical knee-jerk reaction. In that Rocky film, Dolph Lundgren, I don't know if you remember him, you know, he, um, he played the evil Russian and we had these stereotypes that people began to, um, or people really do believe stereotyping is just a shortcut for people who, um, for whatever reason, don't understand what's really going on. Well, do you think the internet has made things better in understanding other cultures and uh, given reporters and people in the media an opportunity to look at a, a little more nuanced at other cultures, or is it worse? <laughs> well, I love this joke that I saw a few weeks ago that started the COVID-19 epidemic. They said now everyone can put their constitutional law degree away and pull out their epidemiology degree. You know, you have all of these people who are just, you know, uh, pretty much the drugstore cowboys sitting around deciding, um, you know, and they, and they do, um, if you look at your peer group, you lean on your peer group for information. Um, I think it makes it harder for reporters. It makes it harder for the credibility of reporters. Uh, the 24, new, new, 24 hour news cycle changes the way that we uh, cultivate news, the way we cultivate sources. Um, the way we present information, you know, the, the decline of the long form narrative is very, very detrimental to that. Um, and yet that's the world we're dealing with and we need to learn to, to adapt to that. And uh, on the other side, the consumers also need to learn to adapt to that. Say, well, maybe my, my uh, buddy Billy Bob is not the, the right guy to ask about my safety during COVID-19. You know, he's not a guy who's experienced in that. How we, how we vet and decide what a source is uh, has changed rapidly. Um, and well, that's yeah. Rapidly. Yeah, of what I see, uh, COVID-19, it's almost a metaphor, uh, the way people react to it. It's almost a metaphor, or it is a metaphor, for the bigger issues happening. And um, it seems like some people, it seems like we're in parallel universes. And some people are choosing to indulge in magical thinking about this versus the, uh, the, the facts that science and, and medical uh, communities bring to this. And... Um, that's very perplexing to me that the 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 level of myopic uh, blind trust that's going on. But don't you think it has a lot to do with how people cultivate what they know? You know, I, I remember, and I think I mentioned this in the book at the very start of the pandemic. I was with my banker and. Um, they were closing the bank that day so they could all go to Charlotte to a meeting to address how they were going to handle the pandemic. And, and I said, well, you know, this is probably the last time I'm going to be out. And she said, oh, you know, I don't believe in that. I think that's all just a bunch of nonsense. And I thought, well, you know, uh, this has a lot to do with everything from how did you grow up? How did you feel about things in school? How do you personally cultivate information to make sense of it? as to whether it's important to you or not. And um, that's one of the points I tried to make in the book was that, you know, we have people uh, talking a lot about their First Amendment rights and their Second Amendment rights, but large format studies on civic engagement show that whereas people say they believe those things, they don't really know what they are. You know, so, you know, fewer than 30% of in one large study of thousands of people in the United States Whereas they said, I believe in the right to bear arms, they couldn't name any of the amendments or any of the, um, you know, any of the rights that are secured in that way. And so, you know, it, we, have, we have a real disconnect as far as civic understanding of how things work. We have a real disconnect as far as basic understanding of what we are as a country and who we are on the ground. And I'm talking just very similar, very, very basic things like what are, where are the states? 
and what are the capitals of the states, things that maybe people in a previous generation, I know I knew this by the time I was in maybe the third grade. You have college students now who don't understand that and don't feel a need to know that and, and because it's shifting so rapidly that what we value changes almost by the minute. Um, so but go back that is to our detriment, our detriment. Go back to uh, clarify what it was you, you knew at in the third grade. Right. So in the third grade, I mean, I grew up, my father was a scientist. My father was a, an organic chemist and my mother was a teacher. And I grew up from a family that was a pretty well-educated family. And in the third grade, we had my mother, you know, we, the games we always played as children were these educational games. We had this little game called the game of the states. And you had a little car and a little wooden disc and you would move from state to state on a board and you would have to answer a question about that state. You know, what is Iowa famous for or what's the capital of South Dakota or whatever. And so I think all that basic knowledge about the states was something that I knew, I'm sure, by the time I was seven or eight years old. And yet you have college students now who don't have the experience of really traveling. I mean, I've taught at universities and I've taught at community college and I always ask this question, well, what's the capital of Virginia? And in my own very unscientific study, my students would say, well, I'm not good at that kind of thing or I've only ever been to Myrtle Beach. And this is the voter base that Trump has so much power over because he is able to use things like epithets, which are the sort of the straight line to stereotyping. He's able to use people's lack of understanding about how the government works and so on to really um, influence them. He's become their opinion leader. And in the book, I talk about you know, two very important theories that relate to him. Uh, you know, the first one is uh, convex perception, which you just talked about. And the second one has to do with referent power which means, you know, we try to find a person that we find powerful and they say something is good and we agree. Um, and he is very, very masterful at using that. I mean, I, um, when I hear him talk now, after considering these theories, I try to always keep in my mind that it's not about what he's saying. It's about the influence on those groups because those, of the groups that won the election for him. Well, what I see is he expresses and he expresses what they're what what they're thinking. I think that he he's very good at uh, expressing um, and 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 in 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 that manner that the way he expresses what they're thinking, they feel very validated by him. Right. And this is the idea uh, of if I were president, I would do that too. You know, that's kind of yes, the, the yes, that yeah. That's, that's, that's what went into the book. If if I were the president, yeah. or if I were the the uh, CEO of of many uh, wealthy places, this was be this would be how I would act. So and you see this in the. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. What I was going to say is, you see, and a good example of this is when Ivanka. Um, you know, went to the um, the G20 summit in um, in Europe. You know, she she actually you know went on the plane with Trump, and there was some you know uh, discussion about whether that was appropriate. And a lot of the public discussion had to do with, well, he's her daddy, so why can't she hitch a ride with him? You know, not in, not considering well, that's you know that's a multi million dollar ride. It's not like getting in the back seat of your dad's Civic and going to Florida. It involves a lot of infrastructure and a lot of movement. Um, but you know, again, it's how you make sense of meaning and how mm -hmm. you how you um, you know what inferences you draw from those things. Well, your book, which is a parallel universe. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, your book. Uh, I can tell that you've done a lot of thinking about this. And, uh, but in the beginning, you get into just something that was happening last month. So it's kind of magical that you were able to um, type that in with your book. And so I know generally publishing takes a long time. So how'd you do that? 
Well, you know, I like you said, I've, I've thought about this a lot and I've spoken about this topic a lot um, in places like the UN and, and in Europe at uh, Copenhagen and other places. But um, publishing has changed a lot. And I, I have a book agent and I'm working on other projects with an agent, but the time for this book is now. And it's not perfect. Uh, it's not a perfect process. I, um, I wrote it pretty quickly. Uh, the theories I've worked on for a long time and some of those chapters I, you know, I, I've studied pretty extensively. But um, I think the opportunity now is, is to get things out there. I thought it was the time for people to really consider this. I think it's very important for people to look at this particular angle, angle of how this fits together. So I just sat down and wrote it. Yeah. So um, I appreciate you coming on and I appreciate what you had to say in here. It's very clarifying, uh, kind of uh, concentrates the madness going on in the world down to some, uh, some understandable uh, characteristics and, and uh, behaviors of America. And uh, so what do you have to tell the viewers or the listeners uh, 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 in closing about what they should do with this book? I think, I think the first thing they should do is, is they should take a look at the theory. And the second thing is that people need to understand how the government actually works. They need to understand the basic things of civics. And, you know, how, how are laws made? How are they passed? Who are representatives? How are they elected? And that, of course, you know, includes being registered to vote. And the third thing is media literacy. You know, they need to uh, tap into all the tools that are available to teach them how to evaluate messages, how to separate good sources from bad sources, facts from opinions, uh, and that sort of thing. So I think those are the three big things that that everyone should do is understand the theory so they understand what's going on, understand how the government actually works and understand media literacy so they can evaluate good sources of information from mm -hmm. uh, less than uh, acceptable ones. Well, thank you very much for, for uh, sending me the book and, and uh, educating me on how to look at things more clearly. Well, thank you. It's been such a pleasure to to, uh, to be with you remotely, and I'm looking forward to seeing you in person soon, I hope. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.